Hello, little woman fans. Today's comment shoutout comes from the other art blog. I just reread the part when Joe was trying to study characters that were heroes. She turned to look at Fritz, and then when Lori was trying to create his opera heroine, he thought of Amy. Excuse me while I cry how beautiful this is. Give me an adaptation where Joe and Laurie gush about their partners. This is why I love to talk with little woman fans. People always notice these little details that I might otherwise miss. Yes, the narrator even says something along the lines, Within him she found a true life hero. And that was when Joe was creating characters and observing Fritz. And when Laurie conjures the dream woman that looks like Amy, the narrator says, quote, He took her to his hearing and gifted her with every gift under the sun. Don't ask me why I remember all of these things. There's this quote from Musame Alcott where she says that she is a hero worshipper by nature. When we think about the relationships, in an ideal relationship, there is mutual respect, and Joe and Laurie both equally admire Amy and Fritz for who they are. It really shows that they fall in love with their personalities and their nature. I have very exciting news for you. I am writing a book. It is going to have the transcripts of the first three seasons of the Little Woman podcast. I thought about this in my Tumble blog, and I am going to read you some of the name suggestions. And some of these are really good, and they could work. From the Phony Queen of England. The real woman behind the little woman. What you were never told about little woman. What every adaptation gets wrong in little woman. Joe March and everything you never knew. The Algots, the Marches, and the similarities between. What Hollywood doesn't want you to know about Little Woman. Little Woman adaptations are all the same and none of them are like the book. I really like this. ASDFGHJKK12345 suggests how not to adapt Little Woman. And then she comments, or oh, that one can be a chapter title just for the 2019 film. I second that. Honestly, Transparent Collector Alarm suggests everything Hollywood gets wrong about Little Woman or the real-life show March and her sisters. Good ones. I will send these suggestions to the publisher as well. If you are watching this on YouTube or somewhere with a comment section, you can write your name suggestions as well. How would you, how would you title my book? This diversion between the book and the movie seems to be a pretty popular topic and we can see that in these name suggestions and it is true there are so many scenes in the book that never gets adapted and then there are scenes that are always adapted but they're not in the book like joe and frederick arguing we really don't need those scenes and i have no idea why they are there annabelle and i continue our chat about little man and the chapter sunday there's a scene in this chapter where Friedrich tells a story about God's garden and it is a metaphor for the school and the students. I believe this is a story that, that Henry David Thoreau used to tell to his students. There is so much intertextuality in Alcott's work between the things that happened to her or people that were close to her. You can find Little Woman Podcast on Instagram at Podcasting Little Woman. And check out our merchandise at society6 slash little woman podcast. And there you can get mugs, bandanas and yoga mats with designs of your favorite little woman characters. This is a little woman podcast, Plumfield Alcott's Children's Paradise. I'd like Toby the donkey best, if I could have anything. It is so nice to ride, and he's so little and good, said Nat, remembering the weary tramps he had taken on his own tired feet. Oh, poor Nat. Oh. I, I feel that. I mean, I mean, I didn't have to walk as much, like, because I wasn't a traveling musician. I can imagine how tired Verity must get and stuff. 
Mr. Lorry sent him out to Mrs. Bear so she shouldn't carry Teddy on her back when we go to walk. We're all fond of Toby, and he's a first-rate donkey, sir. Those pigeons belong to the whole lot of us. We each have our pet one and go shares in all the little ones as they come along. Squabs are great fun. There ain't any now, but you can go up and take a look at the old fellows while I see if Cockletop and Granny have laid any eggs. Those are pretty nice names for hens. <laughs> Granny. <laughs> Personally, if I ever get a, a, a few hens, I'm going to name them after the Andrews sisters. <laughs> Maxine, Patty, and Laverne. Oh, I love that. I don't know why. I just think that those are really good names for hens. Don't know why. Always have. Ever since. <laughs> Yeah, when I had my uh, my cat, I was like, I'm going to name you after some kind of Disney character. So now my cat's name is Belle. Aww. But if it was going to be a boy, then it would have been Thomas O'Malley after Aristocats. <laughs> yeah, one of the best characters in that movie. Oh yeah. I always liked Belle, so she became Belle. It's a good cat name. Do they have any cats in in uh, in Plumfield? I think they had a cat. Cats around there somewhere. Yes, it is mentioned that they also had a cat. So so far they have mice, turtle, lots of dogs, a donkey, a guinea pig, a cat, and hens. And they must have a rooster. Is that all? <laughs> Oh, the worms, the worms. Worms. I love this place. I didn't realize they had so many animals there. It's nice. Oh, they also have six sleek cows. I mean, where else are they going to get milk? They need cows. Milk for the babies. <laughs> Plumfield is a, an animal farm. This is amazing. Dan, later on, he has even more animals because he brings stuff from the forest and all kinds of bugs and everything. He really got into nature. Good for him. It was one of the things that I liked about his character. He was so in touch with the wilderness. Everybody has got something but me. I wish I had a dove or a hen or even a turtle all my own, thought Nat, feeling very poor as he saw the interesting treasures of the other boys. How do you get these things? he asked when he joined Tommy in the barn. We find them or buy them or folks give them to us. My father sends me mine but as soon as I get egg money enough I am going to buy a pair of ducks. There is a nice little bond for them behind the barn and people pay well for duck eggs and the little duckies are pretty it's fun to see them swim, said Tommy, with an air of a millionaire. Aww, this is cute. Nat sighed, for he had neither father nor money. Nothing in the wide world but an old empty pocketbook and the skill that lay in his ten fingertips. Tommy seemed to understand the question and sighed, I which followed his answer. For after a moment of deep thought, he suddenly broke out. Look here, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you hunt eggs for me, I hate it, I'll give you one egg out of every dozen. You keep a count, and when you've had twelve, Mother Bear will give you twenty-five cents for them. And then you can buy what you like, don't you see? I'll do it! What a kind feller you are, Tommy, cried Nat, quite dazzled by this brilliant offer. Pooh, that is not anything. You begin now and rummage the barn, and I'll wait for you. Granny is cackling, so you're sure to find one somewhere. And Tommy threw himself down on the hay with a luxurious sense having made a good bargain and done a friendly thing. Nat joyfully began his search and went rustling from loft to loft till he found two fine eggs, one hidden under a beam, and the other in an old back measure Mrs. Cockletop had appropriated. You may have one and I'll have the other. That will just make up my last dozen and tomorrow we'll start fresh. Here, you chalk your counts up near mine and then we'll be all straight, said Tommy, showing a row of mysterious figures on the smooth side of an old winnowing machine. 
with a delightful sense of importance, the proud possessor of one egg opened his account with his friend who laughingly wrote above the figures these imposing words, T. Panks and Co. Tom is a little businessman. It's cute. They're adorable. How old do you think Nat is when he comes to live with the bears? I always figured anywhere from like 9 to 12. I think we can count that from Daisy's age. I think Daisy is like 9 or 10. So maybe Nat is also 9 or 10. I don't really know about Tommy, but I think he's about the same age. kind of hard to keep track of people's ages, because only a few characters have a yeah. sad age. Poor Nat found them so fascinating that, that he was, with difficulty, persuaded to go and deposit his first piece of portable property in Asia's storeroom. Then they went on again, and having made the acquaintance of two horses, six cows, three pigs, and one Alderney bossy, as cats are called in New England, Tommy took Nat to a certain willow tree that overhung on a noisy little brook. From the fence, it was an easy scramble to a wide niche between three big branches, which had been cut off to send out from year to year a crowd of slender twigs, fixed till a green in canopy rustled overhead. Here, little seats had been fixed, and a hollow piece of a of closet made a big enough to hold a book or two, a dismantled boat, and several half-finished whistles. Oh, there's more animals than we thought. I think this is like a little hideaway place of them. Kind of like a treehouse, except, I don't know if it's like the right way to describe it, but it's what it reminds me of. Some kind of a building hidden in the <laughs> garden brook. It sounds like a nice place to spend time if you're a child or even yeah. as an adult yeah tree houses are underrated oh yeah i wish i would have had a tree house when i was a child but no no but then i was always playing in the woods anyway <laughs> yeah i was the same way we didn't really have any trees in our yard but i was always like playing in the yard and stuff backyard was a little painful though because grass was always dry and dead in the backyard compared to the front. But I still played in it anyway. Yeah, this sounds like a nice place to play. I'm jealous. This is Demis and my private place. We made it and nobody can come up unless we let them, except Daisy. We don't mind her, said Tommy, as Nat looked with delight from the babbling brown water below to the green arch above, where bees were making a musical murmur as they feasted on the long yellow blossoms that filled the air with sweetness. Oh, it is just beautiful, cried Nat. I do hope you let me up sometimes. I never saw such a nice place in all my life. I'd like to be a bird and live here always. It's pretty nice. You can come if Demi don't mind, and I guess he won't because he said last night that he liked you. Did he? And Nat smiled with pleasure, for Demi's regard seemed to be valued by all the boys, partly because he was Father Bear's nephew, and partly because he was such a sober, conscientious little fellow. <laughs> I have a, a note here. A sober, conscientious little fellow. Louisa May Alcott's ideal man slash boy. It's interesting how... In Little Man, people sometimes criticize that, oh, Joe didn't have girl students, but in Little Man, she and Frederick start to take girl students. But people kind of miss the historical context because it was really up to this age when people actually started to pay more attention to, to girls' education. And it was very unusual to have like schools with both boys and girls mixed yeah, I, I, I'm a history major. Sometimes, like when people like miss the historical context of things, it like always bothers me because it's like it's like we live in the age of the internet. You you can look this stuff up. So that is 
One of the reasons why I like to mention in this podcast that yeah, Joe starts a school for boys, but then later on she also takes girl students because world changes during this time period. It becomes more and more acceptable for boys and girls to study in the same school and be in the same room, <laughs> study together. Yeah. Things didn't just born out of nowhere. There's there's a long history behind this. Yes, Demi likes quiet chats. And I guess he and you will get on on if you care about reading as he does. Poor Nat's flush of pleasure deepened into a painful scarlet at those last words, and he stammered out. I can't read very well. I never had any time. I was always fiddling around, you know. I don't love it myself, but I can do well enough if I when I want to, said Tommy, after a surprised look, plainly as worth. A boy is twelve years old and can't read. I can read music anyway, added Nat, rather ruffled at having to confess his ignorance. I can't, and Tommy spoke in a respectful tone, which emboldened Nat to say firmly, I mean to study real hard and learn everything I can, for I never had a chance before. Does Mr. Bear give hard lessons? No, he isn't a bit cross. He sort of explains and gives you a boost over the hard places. Some folks don't. My other master didn't. If we missed a word, we didn't we get wrapped on the head? And Tommy rubbed his own own tape as if it tingled with still yet with the liberal supply of wraps, the memory of which was the only only thing he brought out away after a year with his other master. Oh my god. Yeah, I hadn't realized this, that he's been abused by his teacher. That's terrible. Yeah. I also feel like if I would go to Frederick's lessons, I had a total crush on him. And it's so funny, people are like, oh, he's a terrible person. Have you read Little Man? Have you read Little Woman? Because Louisa May Alcott, or Joe, definitely adores Frederick. He's in a bit cross. He sort of explains and gives you a boost over the hard places. I love that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I've had teachers that weren't exactly that nice either. I mean, I wasn't hit or anything, but I remember, I I do remember in fifth grade, we were doing this Christmas concert, and I lost my voice because I was really nervous, and I remember my teacher was yelling at me, saying stuff like, you ruined the concert, or, and all that stuff. That's terrible. <laughs> my preschool teacher did hit me, though. Oh my gosh. Yeah, she had 10 years, so she couldn't get fired, but... Like, up until that point, my dad would spank me whenever I was mad. He never spanked me after that. That's terrible. Yeah, she, she had 10 years, so she couldn't get fired, but my, da- but my dad was cussing her out. Probably should have waited until I left the room, but I understand why he was so mad about it. And she didn't get fired. She had tenure. Insane. I say that if that's okay. It, it's not. No, it, it is not okay at all. I haven't been hit by a teacher, but yeah, I had some pretty horrible teachers. Some of them were good, some were not so good. This part where Tommy says how Freddie helps the students to boost over the hard places. I had this experience when I was 13 or something, and uh, me and my best friends, we went to this class of stupid kids to study math. Oh my god. We were called stupid because we couldn't keep up with, with our math teacher. So then we went to the stupid kid class, and my grade on math, it got better, like three grades better from very bad to decent and sometimes even good. Two years later, they had some kind of problems with the smart kid class because the the teacher had like 
meltdowns or something with the students because he thought they weren't smart enough. Wow. <laughs> Another math teacher that I had, he really was like Fritz and helped me with the hard places. And that, that is why I don't hate math anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they call it stupid kids class. Sometimes children can be cruel. Yeah. But in my case it was very good because I liked the other teacher and the class was, it was a lot smaller because there were less students and then the teacher would spend time with each of us. That really helped. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and in this other class I didn't understand anything that the teacher was saying and he didn't have any time for me to teach it. I just love Redick. I think I could read this, said Nat, who had been examining the books. Read a bit then. I'll help you, reassured Tommy with a patronizing air. So Nat did his best and floundered through a page with many friendly boosts from Tommy, who told him he would soon go it, as well as anybody. Then they sat and talked boy fashion about all sort of things, among others, gardening. For Nat, looking down from his perch, asked what was planted in the many little patches lying below them on the other side of the brook. These are our farms, said Tommy. We each have our own patch and raise what we like in it. Only we have to choose different things and can't change till the crop is in. And we must keep it in order all summer. What are you doing? What are you going to raise this year? Well, I catalated to you to have beans, as they are about the easiest crop a going. Nat could not help laughing, for Tommy had pushed back his hat, put his hands in his pockets, and trolled out his words in an unconscious imitation of Silas, the man who managed the place for Mr. Bear. This is another connection to Henry David Thoreau because when Henry was teaching in Concord, he would give like these garden patches for his students. Frederick and Joe, they do the same. That's nice. Mm. Also, like I like the fact that Tommy is also helping that, like taking like inspiration from like teaching Redrick. And it's like that is just so wholesome. He's clearly influenced by him for good. Like, he's a good role model for Tommy. Tom, you needn't laugh. Beans are ever so much easier than corn and potatoes. I tried melons last year, but the bugs were a bother. The old things wouldn't get right before the frost, so I didn't have but one good water and two little mushmelons. Melly and relapse, said Tommy, relapsing into a silentism with the last word. Corn <laughs> looks pretty growing, said Nat, politely to atone for his laugh. Yeah, but you have to hoe it over and over again. Now, six-week beans only have to be done once or so. They get right soon. I'm going to try them for I spoke first. Not if you wanted them, but he's got to take peas. They only have to be picked, and he ought to do it. He eats such a lot. I wonder if I shall have a garden, said Ned, thinking that even corn hoeing must be pleasant work. Of course you will, said a voice from below, and there was Mr. Bear returned from his walk and come to find them, for he managed to have a little talk with every one of the lads sometime during the day, and found these chats to give them a good start for the coming week. There he is. There's my man, Fritz. In descending from their nest, Tommy fell into the brook. Being used to it, he calmly picked himself out and returned to the house to be tried. I want to go to the brook, too. I want to go swimming there. It seems nice. This left Nat to Mr. Bear, which was just what he wished, and during the stroll they took among the garden plots, he won the lad's heart by giving him a little farm, and discussing crops with him as gravely as if the food for the family depended on the harvest. From this pleasant topic they went to others, and Nat had many new and helpful thoughts put into a mind that received them as gratefully as the thirsty earth had received the warm spring rain. 
All supper time he brooded over them, often fixing his eyes on Mr. Bear with an inquiring look that seemed to say, I like that. Do it again, sir. I don't know whether the man understood the child's mute language or not, but when the boys were all gathered in Mrs. Bear's parlor for the Sunday evening talk, he chose a subject which might have been suggested by the walk in the garden. When I have read Little Man, I always felt that Nat sort of longs to have a mother in Joe. He also longs to have a father in Friedrich. He kind of sees them as his parents, as the book progresses. That is the whole point of Joe's family. She wanted to have this flock of boys. And she got it. Mm. Good for her. Yeah. I made an episode earlier if Joe starting a school for boys can be a feminist act. <laughs> I do think it can be because when Joe raises her boys, she wants them to be respectful human beings. As he looked about him, Nat thought oh, it seemed more like a great family than a school. She's the endemic of the knees of Uncle Fred, and Rob snugly towed away in the back of his mother's easy chair, where he could nod unseen if the talk uh, got beyond his depth. Everyone looked quite comfortable and listened attentively to the long walk made rest agreeable, and as every boy there knew that he would be called upon for his views, he kept his wits awake to be ready with an answer. Oh, uh, that's, that's kind of cute. I love this so much. They are just relaxing, spending time together. Once upon a time, began Mr. Bear, in the dear old-fashioned way, there was a great and a wise gardener who had the largest garden ever seen, a wonderful and lovely place it was, and he watched over it with the greatest skill and care, and raised all manner of excellent and useful things. But weeds would grow even in this fine garden. Often the ground was bad, and the good seeds sown on it would not spring up. He had many under-gardeners to help him. Some did their duty and earned the rich wages he gave them, but others neglected their parts and let them run to waste, which displeased him much. But he was very patient, and for thousands and thousands of years he worked and waited for his great harvest. He must have been pretty old, said Demi. Hush, Demi, it's a fairy story, whispered Daisy. No, I think it is an allegory, said Demi. What is an allegory? called out Tommy, who was of an inquiring turn. Tell him, Demi, if you can, and don't use words unless you are quite sure you know what they mean, said Mr. Bear. I do know, Grandpa told me. A fable is an allegory. It's a story that means something. My story without an end is one because the child in it means a soul, don't it, auntie? cried Demi, eager to prove himself right. That's it, dear. An uncle's story is an allegory. I am quite sure. So listen and see what it means, returned Mrs. Joe. Demi composed himself and Mr. Bear went on, in his best English, for he had improved much in the last five years, and said the boys did it. This great gardener gave a dozen or so of little plots to one of his servants, and told him to do his best and see what he could raise. Now this servant was not rich, nor wise, nor very good, but he wanted to help because the gardener had been very kind to him in many ways, so he gladly took the little plots and fell to work. They were all sorts of shapes and sizes, and some were very good soil, some rather stony, and all of them needed much care, for in the rich soil the weeds grew fast, and in the poor soil there were many stones. I think this is another allegory to Henry David Thoreau, because he often refers to the earth as God's garden. And I remember reading this. This is actually something that Henry writes in some of his uh, essays. Something very similar. Sometimes I wonder if it's little woman or little man where Henry is more present. 
but I'd say he's kind of present in all of these books. Yeah, I think so too. But I'd say, especially in Little Man, because there are so many transcendentalist themes in this book, especially when it comes to, like, Friedrich's religious teachings, and then how he makes these allegories with nature. That's something that Henry did a lot. It's also nice how Louisa May Alcott mentions that Friedrich's English has improved a lot. I guess so. If you are married to an American woman, you your English gets better. <laughs> I do like that. She pays attention to these kind of little details, like even how how someone's language improves. It's nice that like I believe it's not really touched on until like a later chapter. That I think that that Friedrich Friedrich is t- teaching the voice German like cause I believe like in one chapter I can't remember if it's Rob or Teddy but one of them is speaking German yes at least a little bit and it's just like aww it's so cute you know when I read Little Man you don't really get the feeling that Louis Amell would somehow hate it for Eric's character like some people like to say it feels really very much the opposite I think it was a Tumblr post I read that, but, like, if she really hated him, she would have just killed him off or pushed him off to the background with only the occasional reminder that he was there. Yeah, and instead we get tons of making out since between Joe and Friedrich. I don't buy that theory at all. <laughs> yeah, good for them. Those are some of my favorite moments in the entire book series. I actually recently got someone leaving a comment on a podcast that they were doing the study on sex in Victorian books and they were going to use Little Woman as a reference <laughs> how the, these intimate scenes are very subtle but they are definitely there it's kind of funny but it's true because you wouldn't be able to write these kind of things very directly during this time period but like now that you brought it up, I can't not see it. Like the Goldilocks chapter and after makeout. When John and Meg have an, the sex scene in Little Woman, it's called as moment of bliss. And then in the Goldilocks chapter, it's referred as moment of truest rest and happiness. But that's sort of an allegory that Louis and my Albert uses. It's very subtle. Very subtle. We actually made another video about John and Meg, and there was a, another sex scene between them. Also very, very subtle. I can send you a link to it. Sure. <laughs> I just love this so much. What was growing in them besides the weeds and stones? Asked Nap, so interested he forgot his shyness and spoke before them all. Flowers, said Mr. Bear with a kind look. Even the roughest, most neglected little bed has had a bit of heart's ease or a sprig of mignonette in it. One had roses, sweet peas, and daisies in it. Here he p- pinched the plump cheek of the little girl leaning on his arm. Another had all sorts of curious plants in it. Ripe pebbles, a vine that went climbing up like Jack's beanstalk, and many good seeds just beginning to sprout. For, you see, this bed had taken fine care had been taken fine care of by a, by a wise old man who had worked in gardens of this sort all his life. At this part of the allegory, Demi put his head on one side like an inquisitive bird and fixed his bright eye on his uncle's face, and if he suspected something and was on the watch. But Mr. Bear looked perfectly innocent, and on glancing from one young face to another with a grave, wistful look, that said much to his wife, who knew how earnestly he desired to do his duty in these little garden plots. That is the cutest thing ever. (laughs) It is. It's interesting how Demi and Daisy, they want to spend more time at Plumfield than at their own home, but probably because there are all these playmates in Plumfield. 
I feel like if something bad would happen to John and Meg, then Joe and Freddy were the ones who would take care of them. I mean, they are close by. Yeah. You can just, like, run to home after each day. <laughs> Freddy is the, really the one who teaches them. He's their main teacher. They go to school there, and then they play there, and then they spend time there, and maybe they go home to sleep. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> As I tell you, some of these beds were easy to cultivate. That means to take care of. Daisy and others were very hard. There was one particularly sunshiny little bed that might have been full of fruits and vegetables, as well as flowers, only it wouldn't take any pains. And when the man sowed, well, we'll say melons in his bed, they came to nothing because the little bed neglected them. The man was sorry and kept on trying, though every time the crop failed, all the bed said was, I forgot. Here a general laugh broke out and everyone looked at Tommy, who had prickled up his ears at the word melons, and hung down his head at the sound of his favorite excuse. I knew he meant us, cried Demi, clapping his hands. You are the man... And we are the little gardens, aren't we, Uncle Fritz? You have guessed it. Now each of you tell me what crop I shall try to sow in you this spring so that next autumn I may get a good harvest out of my twelve, no, thirteen plots, said Mr. Bear, nodding at Nat, as he corrected himself. You can't sow corn and beans and peas in us, unless you mean we are to eat a great many and get fat said Stuffy, with a sudden brightening of his round, dull face as the pleasing idea cured him. He don't mean that kind of seed. He means things to make us good, and the weeds are false, cried Demi, who usually took the lead in these talks because he was used to this sort of thing and liked it very much. Yes, each of you think what you need most, and tell me, and I will help you to grow it. Only you must do your best, or you will turn out like Tommy's melons, or leaves and no fruit. I will begin with the oldest and ask the mother what she will have in her plot, for we are all part of the beautiful garden and may have rich harvest for our master, if we love him enough, said Father Bear. I shall devote the whole of my plot to the largest crop of patience I can get, for that is what I need most, said Mrs. Joe so soberly that the lads fell to thinking in good earnest that what they should say when their turns came, and some among them felt a twinge of remorse that they had helped to use up Mother Bear's stock of patience so fast. I think we could all use some patience now and then. Especially dealing with a bunch of boys. I mean, I know she loves it, but like... And they probably tried her patience so much, but she probably wouldn't have it any other way. I think it said in the end of Little Woman how Cho would sometimes have these meltdowns when she was trying to start a school and then Freddy would calm her down. But that is a very high demanding job, so you will need someone who can calm you down. Franz wanted perseverance, Tommy steadiness. Ned went in for good temper, Daisy for industry, Demi for as much wiseness as Grandpa, and Nat timidly said he wanted so many things he would let Mr. Bear choose for him. This boy is so, so humble. Good temper and generosity seemed the favorite crops. One boy wished to like to get up early, but did not know what name to give that sort of seed. I think that would be me. <laughs> and poor stuffy side out. I wish I loved my lessons as much as I do my dinner, but I can't. That is relatable. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the same. We will plant self denial and hoe it and water it and make it grow so well that next Christmas no one will get ill by eating too much dinner. If you exercise your mind, George, it will get hungry. 
It will get hungry just as your body does, and you will love books almost as much as my philosopher here, said Mr. Bear, adding as he stroked the hair of Demi's fine forehead. You are greedy also, my son, and you like to stuff your little mind full of fairy tales and fancies, as well as George likes to fill his little stomach with cake and candy. Do you remember the chocolate drop scene, little woman? Yeah. I remember, like, Demi was jealous because this guy was, this, this stranger was taking all his, all his aunt's attention, but he felt bad because he always had, the strangers always had, like, chocolate drops for, <laughs> for them, and it's like, and then he felt bad for being angry at this guy. It's so funny because he's like, the bear uncle, how, how he called him, bear uncle. <laughs> Their uncle would come and take Aunt Jo's attention, but he offered this endless amount of chocolate drops. I think there was a, like a moment when he asked, Do big boys like big girls? So he's shipping them. It's adorable. But that's one of those chapters where you can see how Jo is their favorite friend to play with. Both are bad, and I want you to try something better. Arithmetic is not... Half so pleasant as Arabian Nights, I know, but it is a very useful thing, and now is the time to learn it, else you will ashamed and sorry by and by. But Harry and Lucy and Frank are not fairy books. They are all full of barometers and bricks and shoeing, horses and useful things, and I am fond of them. Ain't I, Daisy? said Demi, anxious to defend himself. So they are. But I find you reading Roland and Maybird a great deal oftener than Harry and Lucy, and I think you are not half as fond of Frank as you are of Sinbad. Come, I shall make a little bargain with you both. George shall eat but three times a day, and you shall read but one story book a week, and I will give you the new cricket ground. Only you must promise to play in it, said Uncle Fritz in his persuasive way. For stuff he hated to run about, and Demi was always reading in play hours. Do you know any of these books that are mentioned here? Only like Arabian Nights and Sinbad, but other than that, I haven't really heard of a lot of these books. Can't say I have heard them either, but I think I'm going to Google them. <laughs> but we don't like cricket, said Demi. Perhaps not now, but you will when you know it. Besides, you you do like to be generous, and the other boys want to play, and you can give them the new ground if you chose. This was taking them both on the right side, and they agreed to the bargain, with great satisfaction of the rest. There was a little more talk about the gardens, and then they all sang together, and the band delighted in that, for Mrs. Bear played the piano, Franz the flute, Mr. Bear a vast viol, and he himself the violin. A very simple little concert, but they all seemed to enjoy it, and old Asia, sitting in the corner, joined at times with the sweetest voice of any, for in this family, master and servant, old and young, black and white, shared in the Sunday song, which went up to the father of them all. After this, they shook hands with Father Bear, Mother Bear kissed them, as every one of the and from the 16-year-old Franz to little Rob, how kept the tip of her nose for his own particular kisses, and then they trooped off to bed. That is so cute. And that Freddy gives his violin to Nat. I'm not sure what a viol is. Let me Google that. It's similar to a violin, but not a violin. I think it is mentioned in Little Woman that Freddy did play violin. He's very musical. He and Joe sing often together. I don't think that's really like in the adaptations that they sing together. They do sing a lot in the books. found out that Roland and Maybird is a story from Brothers Grimm, very similar to Hansel and Gretel. Let's check out Harry and Lucy. Do I found anything? I'm only getting one direction. <laughs> Someone who is listening to this tell me what is this book that is referred here? I'm only getting one direction. <laughs> I don't think that's it. <laughs> yeah, me, me either. Thank you so much for listening.
Annabelle and I continue our chat next time. Take care and make good choices. Bye.